Hello, my name is Moira Cameron and I am a Yeoman Warder of the Tower of London. And there have been people like me guarding the Tower on behalf of the Queen or the King for hundreds and hundreds of years, since 1098. And to become a Yeoman Warder, back then, you would have to buy the position. But that was up until 1826. From then on, it has all been former military personnel. And we must have completed a minimum of 22 years service in Her Majesty's Armed Forces. We must have our Long Service and Good Conduct Medal, the one on the end here. And we've also got to have our Royal Warrant, which means we were all former Sergeant Majors or equivalent throughout the three services. So we are still the guardians of the Tower today and we're often called Beef Eaters. And you know, a lot of people ask us every day, why are you called Beef Eaters? The answer is, we don't know. It is just a nickname. It was given to us a long time ago and it was never written down. But we think it's probably because we used to be paid a ration of meat as part of our wages. Now, the uniform that you see me in today is the blue undress uniform. And this is just basically our working uniform. Sometimes people say, where is the red and gold uniform? Well, that is our state uniform. We only wear that on very, very special occasions, like when Her Majesty the Queen is visiting. Now, in 2007, I became the very first female to be appointed as a Yeoman Warder here at the Tower of London. And I spent 10 years before the second female started. So there's two females now and 35 men. And we all get to live here at the Tower of London, which is incredibly lucky. But we are all very proud to continue to serve Her Majesty the Queen. Now, I love learning about London and all its history. And now I've told you a little bit about me. Let me tell you a little bit about something that happened a long time ago, not very far from here. The Great Fire of London. Here is an artist's view of London in 1666. The film will help you imagine what London looked like back in those days. Many of the streets were lined with homes made of wood and pitch. Some were four storeys high. The upper storeys of these homes overhung the lower ones and projected right out into the street, which blocked the sun and meant there was only a little space between the buildings. This type of building and London's growing population had created a fireman's nightmare. A city full of old, dry, wooden structures, tightly packed into a confined space, just waiting for a spark to ignite disaster. Notice how narrow the streets are. All the buildings are built very close together. You can see how some of the upper floors jut out into the street. The streets are cobbled and very uneven. It is not very clean out in these streets, as people throw their waste outside. See the market stalls outside? London was a big city, even back in the 1660s. Lots of people lived there and lots of people worked there. It was an important place to buy and sell things. It was a very busy, crowded city. Today it is still a very big city with lots of people living in London, some 7.5 million. And it remains a very busy place with lots of people working there and travelling into London to work every day. Back in the 1660s, many people living in England decided to move to London because there was lots of work there. The buildings had not changed very much since the Middle Ages. There were narrow cobblestone streets. The city was very crowded and living conditions were not very clean. The streets did not smell very nice as people tipped out the contents of their chamber pots into the street. People did not really bother trying to throw rubbish away in the right places. Anything from old food to broken toys and tools would end up in the River Thames. There wasn't any way to wash up properly. And people would use the river to wash up in. And even empty their chamber pots into. So the River Thames was dirty. Yet people still bathed and washed their clothes there. Sadly, because of this, 
people got very sick. Luckily today we have washing machines and bathrooms to use and have our refuse collected regularly. We know a lot about how to keep healthy and to eat lots of fruit and vegetables. But our story begins in Pudding Lane, where there was a baker's shop. The shop was owned by Thomas Farmer. He was a well-known baker in Pudding Lane and famous for his pies and biscuits. It was thought that the fire started in the early hours of the morning, at one o'clock. So just think about it, how easy it was for a tiny spark in those cramped, dry conditions to start a small fire that just kept getting bigger and bigger. Once it started, it spread very quickly. We know from paintings of that time that people tried to get away from the fire by using boats to cross the River Thames. Today, we take lots of photos on our mobile phones to record what we see, then we can share them easily. Back then, the things that happened during the Great Fire of London were recorded by people like Samuel Pepys, who wrote diaries, and artists who painted what they had seen. There was also lots of documents and maps created that have been kept safely over the years. So how did the people in Pudding Lane get help? Well, they had to get out of the building as quickly as they could and run to get help and shout fire very loudly. So why did the fire spread so quickly? It was the steady wind which fanned the flames to help the fire spread to the surrounding streets and neighbourhoods. Some people got to the river and escaped by boat. By eight o'clock in the morning, the fire had reached the Thames and almost got halfway across London Bridge. The fire was only stopped because there was a gap in between the shops along the bridge. How do you think the people and children would have been feeling? Scared? Worried? Nervous? Sad? I think they would have been very worried and scared. Then afterwards, very sad that they had lost their home and many possessions. The fire became so enormous it could be seen some 40 miles away from the city. Elsewhere, the fire raged uncontrollably, destroying all in its path for three days. The king ordered firefighters to blow up buildings with gunpowder to make a gap in the buildings which would help stop the fire. Gradually on the fourth day, the winds grew weaker and that helped reduce the fire so that it could be extinguished. The fire was finally put out on the 6th of September, 1666, four days after it started. The fire had destroyed 13,200 homes, 87 churches and the original St Paul's Cathedral. Fortunately, the cathedral was redesigned by Sir Christopher Wren and is a great tourist attraction in London today. Many people love to visit it. As it was such a long time ago, we really do not know how many people were hurt or died. As then, people who were poor would never been recorded. This all seems very scary, doesn't it? Do you think we could have a great fire in a city, town or village today? Well, fortunately, we have lots of safety measures in place and safety rules to help us keep safe from fire. Do you know any of them? I am sure you have shouted out lots of ideas. But did you think of any of these ones that I have thought of? In 1666, naked flames and fires were used to cook food. Today we have gas and electric cookers and microwaves and they all have temperature controls so we select the correct heat for what we are cooking. And we know not to leave our cooking unattended and turn off as soon as we have finished. Also, candles were used for light back then and people walked from room to room carrying their candles. We do use candles in our homes today. Many have a lovely smell. And we put them in containers so they are safe and cannot easily be knocked over. 
We also teach children that candles can easily set things on fire, so they should always be in a safe place and never left in a room when there is no one there. We use them for celebrating birthdays on top of cakes and we let the children blow out the candles. But we teach young children that matches and fires are dangerous and adults must keep them in a safe place. When it comes to lighting our homes today, we use electric lights that we can switch on and off as we want to. These lights are brighter and much safer than candles, but with all things that use electricity, we must be very careful. We have to be careful when plugging lots of items into extension leads, not to overload them. We must be careful with mobile phone chargers and not leave things charging overnight or on bed or under pillows. Our buildings have changed. We use brick and stone and we have building regulations or safety rules that help make sure that our homes are safe as possible for us. Now, I am thinking about a special safety item that helps people be safe and know if a fire starts. Do you know what that special thing is? Yes, you are correct, a smoke alarm. It is a wonderful safety feature that everyone needs, one on each floor of our homes. The smoke alarm will be like your nose when you're asleep and wake you if it smells smoke. Then everyone in the home must get out, stay out and call the fire service out by dialing 999. The fire service recommends you test your smoke alarm weekly so you always remember to do it. Test the bleep once a week. I like to test my smoke alarm on a Tuesday. Test it Tuesday, but that helps me remember. How did they know there was a fire in 1666? There were no special safety gadgets to help, but it would have been somebody smelling the smoke, seeing the smoke and flames that would shout out loudly, fire, fire, and try to raise the alarm, warning people as they ran down the street. Today, we also have fire escape plans to help us know what to do just in case one day we have a fire in our home. Our smoke alarms warn us and our plan ensures that everyone in the home knows what to do and can get out quickly and safely. Do you have a plan? I know that all schools have a fire plan and that teachers and children practice what they should do. This is so everyone knows what to do and will not get scared and they will learn where the safe meeting place is outside. So having a plan like this in your home is a great idea so everyone knows what to do to get out as quickly as possible from the nearest door to the front of your home all together and do not go back in for anything. Someone to call 999 and explain where you live and that everyone is outside and is safe or if there is someone still inside. This is very important information to give the fire control operator so they can tell the firefighters who will be coming to put out the fire. Did you know that Samuel Pepys wrote in his diary what had happened? That is how we know so much about how the fire spread and what happened. The smoke is very dangerous and it can make you collapse when you breathe lots of it in. That is why you must not go back inside for anything. You are very precious. You can always ask the firefighters to get something from the inside as they are wearing their special protective clothing and their breathing apparatus. This helps them keep safe from the fire and the smoke. Now firefighters today arrive in a red fire appliance that has lots of water inside its tank. Then one of the firefighters finds a nearby hydrant and links up to that. It's a bit like having a tap under the street. Then they pump lots of water onto the fire to put it out. This is very different to what happened in 1666. Then the local people used buckets to throw water onto the fire and had long hooks to help pull down the buildings. And they had some hand pumps to squirt water onto the burning buildings. So how did things change after the Great Fire of London? Well, lots of changes were made. Although the Great Fire was a catastrophe, it did cleanse the city. 
the overcrowded houses that were very dirty and full of germs were destroyed. There was then a chance to rebuild the City of London. After the fire, new rules were brought in and every parish had to have two fire squirts, leather buckets and other fire equipment. An organised fire service and insurance industry was established. Firemen were employed by fire insurance companies. There were many different companies and they all wore different uniforms. To show that you had paid your fire insurance, you would display a metal plaque on the wall. It was known as a fire mark. If the firemen did not see this mark, then they would leave the fire to burn. A royal proclamation put a stop to construction until new regulations had been finished. The 1667 Rebuilding Act aimed to get rid of risks which had helped the fire take hold, including restrictions on the upper floors of houses no longer being permitted to jut out over the street below. Importantly, the building materials that were used also changed. The 1667 Act stated that houses were going to be built of either brick or stone, much like our buildings today. Anyone found to be breaking the new rules would be punished by having their house pulled down. Not only were houses made of wood in 1666, but so were the water pipes, and much of the water supply pipework was destroyed in the fire. Steps were taken to improve this and make water easier to access. This was the early beginnings of a fire hydrant system. We have fire hydrants all over the country and fire and rescue services know where they are and they use them to get the water they need to put out a fire, as the water in the fire engine does not last very long. Thomas Farriner resumed his trade as a baker after the fire. He died in 1670 and was buried in the middle aisle of St Magnus Martyr Church. A monument was erected in Pudding Lane on the spot where the fire began. And if you visit London today, you can see it. It is a reminder of those terrible days in September 1666. I am very happy to know today that firefighters help everyone. Men and women can be firefighters and they work and train together to be really good at their job. When you need their help, in an emergency, you dial 999 and ask for the fire service. We are very lucky to have fire stations near to where we live today and that they will come and help us day or night. All firefighters want us to learn and remember some important fire safety tips to help keep safe from fire at home. You need to have a working smoke alarm on every floor in your home and test it regularly once a week. Test it Tuesday. Have a fire escape plan just in case you need it one day so that everyone in your home knows how to get out safely. Then stay outside and call 999. Never go back inside for anything. Have a door key very near your means of exit so you do not have to waste time looking for one. Also know where the window keys are. Before the last person goes off to bed, switch off anything charging and make sure that tumble dryers and dishwashers have finished. Close as many doors as possible. A closed door can keep the fire from spreading for 15 minutes. Also make sure there is nothing blocking the stairs and the area at the bottom of the stairs is clear. Thank you for listening to my story of the Great Fire of London. I hope you will share the fire safety information that firefighters want you to know with your families and your friends to help them know how to keep safe from fire. You can find lots of helpful safety information on the Dorset and Wiltshire Fire and Rescue Service website. But for now I'd like to say goodbye and keep fire safe and keep learning about things that happened a long time ago. History is really interesting in my opinion. Bye bye. Take care.